My guest today is Dr. Margaret Byrne of UGM Consulting, a boutique consulting firm that helps organisations to achieve strategic outcomes. Her career highlights include securing a million dollars in sponsorship for her research, getting three of her films broadcast on SBS and winning a contract with the Chinese government in Beijing. Welcome to In Her Shoes. Thank you so much. I'd like to talk with you about uh, coaching and mentoring specifically for women. Yes. What role do you feel that coaching and or mentoring play in a woman's advancement within business? Look, I think it, it can be the difference that makes the real difference. Uh, the reason is that often women uh, highly value having somebody uh, stand outside the rumination in their own mind. So someone who's going to be a sounding board mm. to a, a reality check, uh, a reminder, someone who's going to keep them focused on the trajectory of their their career direction, which they do have, um, but often they just want that uh, leg up from the sounding board so that you can check ideas and you can rehearse things before you engage in the real world. So often what a coach does is we, we, we might be looking at a forthcoming meeting that you're going to be involved in that you know is going to be uh, quite pivotal in your career and you want the opportunity to try out different scenarios ahead of the real game and that can be absolutely invaluable for you. What role do mentoring and coaching play in the advancement of women? Look, I think they play an enormously valuable role. Whether the coaching and mentoring is informal through a network of friends, and most women do that for each other anyway, or whether it's formally through uh, a professional coach such as myself that the woman has selected. Um, it enables the woman to feel that there's someone in her corner, someone who's totally on her side, but nevertheless can be an objective sounding board and say, you know, give feedback um, around, uh, so you're thinking of playing that pivotal meeting in this, this particular way. Well, look, let's look at what might be the implications of doing it this way or that way. So there's a kind of rehearsing ahead and also uh, a debriefing once something's uh, taken place. So what are the learning that we can distill from that? So I think that people progress faster when they've got a coach. The coach doesn't need to be someone that you're paying. The coach could be uh, a really great friend who's totally there for you and has got some skills. And pe women often do it for each other. Yes. You know, what we might call peer coaching, where women will have a cup of coffee. Uh, we can see them on a Friday night in um, hotels and bars around this city where they're debriefing with each other. And one woman will tell a friend what sh happened for her that week and the friend will give some insight and advice and they swap over. That's actually coaching mm. too. When you're working uh, with uh, executives in the area of coaching, specifically women, um, what is it that you're typically recommending to them? If you were coaching me, for instance, yes. and say I was going, I wanted to advance through an organisation yes. to more senior positions. Um, what would you advise me? Is it get more skills? Is it learn to network? Or where would you start with someone, perhaps in middle management or even in a, you know, a entry position, looking to advance? Look, that's a great question. And I, I've actually found that it comes down to five things, whatever level you're in, okay. um, whether it's entry level or even very senior. Um, and indeed, whether you're in a large organization or running your own business. Okay. So the first thing is find your own sweet spot because that's where you're going to do your best work. And your sweet spot is where your passions and your capabilities and some need, some industry need or sector need or uh, indeed an organizational need come together. So those three things have to come together. May I ask you on that, when you talk about that niche, is it then for me to identify where can my skills and abilities and passion have me stand out? That's right. Okay. So there has to be some kind of uh, resonance in um, society for what it is you're good at. Okay. Otherwise, you're just going to starve in a garret, aren't you? <laughs> and uh, no, you know, you're know you going to be absolutely brilliant at something, but no one's interested, no one, cares. No one wants it, no <laughs> one cares. Yeah. So there has to be that kind of connection to society. 
And I, I always, especially with women in fact, want to tease apart people's passion and people's capabilities because they're not always the same. Right. People can be really good at things but it isn't their passion yes. and um, often that's why people completely change their life direction and their career course because they found themselves um, midstream doing things that they weren't passionate about and that never works for people. Mm. So it actually does have to be those three things coming together. Okay. Anything else? Look, there are a few other things. Once you've got that, which is the big ticket item. And that's where we would start. That's where we okay. would start. And that's where we would start. Then I'd want to know that you can read, write, and think critically. That you can manage meetings well. That means that you can get a turn and keep a turn to speak. Because meetings are status arena. Mm. Uh, I've got no doubt about that. And if you can't manage meetings well, it's going to be very, very hard for you to rise up, even if you've got talent and potential. And is that meeting, whether it's a one-on-one -on -one or if it's in a Doesn't big, matter. Big, big group? It could be simply a, a cluster of people informally around a computer. Or at the other end of the continuum, it could be a much more formal meeting with a, a dozen people or more in a boardroom. Um, whatever the setting, you've got to be able to put your ideas forward. Otherwise, if, if no one knows that you're brilliant, that's actually not going to be very helpful to your career, is it? And how do we, uh, can you give us a tip? How do we do meetings better? Well, I think that in my experience, and certainly watching people filming uh, men and women in meetings for now more than 120 hours, many women are not good at seizing a turn to speak and uh, more men than women are good at that. So when you look at the airtime that men and women get in meetings, often the preponderance of that airtime will go to the men. And uh, women need to get better at getting the turn to speak. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things I, I, I do is teach women how to get a turn to speak in a meeting and how to protect that turn against interruption so that uh, your idea gets out and gets heard mm. and therefore you get credit for it. Right. Um, another skill is presenting. So being able to present well in an engaging way that is both convincing and has some personal warmth and charm about it. When are you not going to benefit from being able to do that? Oh, in any area of in life. In any area of life. And uh, I also think that uh, learning a portfolio of influencing skills is really important. So for younger women, that's about how do you get things done when you don't have power and you can't make people do things because you're not senior enough. Mm. But for senior women, uh, to rely on your power and status is actually quite alienating to others. So even when you're senior, you often don't want to achieve your result through forcing people to do things. You want to influence them to your way of thinking. So uh, having a portfolio of influencing skills is something that will always be in your treasure chest. I'm not sure whether you're familiar with a book called Influence by Dr. Robert Cialdini. I think it's a wonderful book. Uh, his, it's one of my favorites yeah, in that look, area. His, his work focuses more on persuasion. So I would put that together with influence. But, but his work, I think, has been really illuminating. And one of the reasons that uh, I would recommend that book to people, and I'm so glad that you read it and enjoy it too, is that it's based on evidence. Yes. Uh, and uh, I think that things uh, tend to work better, and women appreciate them more when they know they've got an evidence base. It's more persuasive in itself. Absolutely. Isn't it? <laughs> we um, like to leave our viewers with a, perhaps a next step. So if we're and we're really big champions of having women take up more leadership roles, yes. whether they be the, uh, the owner of a small business or whether they be working for someone else, what would you like to leave us with? Then if I, I I've mentioned those five things, and maybe I'll pick one because it's very down to earth and people can play with it this week, mm. just this week. Notice what happens in the meetings you attend. Who speaks for how long? Um, who doesn't get a turn? And who finds it difficult to hold their turn once they start it? And start to notice the extent to which you're able to be heard in meetings. Just start to notice that mm. and notice the dynamics of meetings. And I think just even 
uh, lifting your uh, powers of observation on that critical area will change things for you because you'll start to see places where you can project your ideas more forcefully. Okay. Thank you again for joining us. What a pleasure.